Hey everybody and welcome. Today we'll be speaking about the future of PC gaming and here with us to talk about this we have three incredible speakers. First we have David Brevik, famous of course for founding Blizzard North and for the little game known as Diablo, but then also founding a bunch of other game studios including Gonzillion and now president of Skystone Games. Second, we have Sean Haran, who's held senior executive roles at 20th Century Fox, Marvel, Riot, and now as chief business officer at Gearbox. Sean, I know you guys had a recent game launch as well, so congrats on that. Thank you. And, and finally, we have Tim Morton, who was at Activision, was CEO of Savage Entertainment, held exec positions at EA, Santa Monica, and Blizzard before starting Frost Giant as CEO. Welcome, guys. And again, thank you all for jumping on to this panel discussion, I am actually very, very excited and happy to have you all here with me today. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. So just kind of jumping right in, I thought we could start with the first question I have, which is really around, you know, so each of you have either started a new game studio or publisher or are publishing new games in IP. And so what are like the specific opportunities you're seeing in the PC market and maybe starting with you, David? Sure. Uh, well, uh, yes, I have both uh, <laughs> my own indie game studio as well as I'm uh, started a publisher just recently, Skystone Games, uh, where we're funding all sorts of different projects. I think one of the big things that we're seeing as a trend uh, in the video game industry, especially in the PC space, is the kind of emergence of teams worldwide. Uh, there's been much more, like we've signed games with Skystone uh, from all over the world, from Brazil, from El Salvador, from uh, from Spain, from uh, China, you know? And so they, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that m more so now than any time ever before, uh, it, the PC market development market is more of a global market than it's ever been. And there's just so many, uh, so many teams out there and so much talent out there that, like uh, that uh, didn't really exist years ago. And so uh, uh, it's really kind of amazing how, how many teams there are out there making games, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it's obviously the good thing is that you get a lot of really diverse games and some really interesting perspectives and new ideas and, uh, and that's fantastic, but obviously, uh, but with all those development teams comes a lot of games and it makes it super competitive. So, uh, uh, it's a, it's a kind of a strange time in the video game industry for PC for sure. And what about you, Sean? Um, yeah, so we're 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 a, we're a developer and a publisher. Um, you know, Gearbox Software has been making games for 21 years, and we've always been uh, on PC. You know, dating back to the Half Life uh, uh, titles that we worked with uh, with Valve. So um, I think in that space, the big opportunity is just more platforms and more opportunities to reach new gamers. You know, the Epic Game Store is a great example of. Uh, the, how PC can grow and find new audiences. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to see how, you know, Tencent and other Chinese game companies are able to launch platforms that kind of cater to more premium experiences, which is kind of what we're known for. And on, and, and on the publishing side, both for our titles and for third-party games, the, the opportunity really is significant for publishers because there's just more places to bring games and more gamers to reach. And, and it kind of creates an opportunity for what I call like mid-market publishers to find exciting teams globally, like, like David said, that could create disruptive experiences that can, you know, shake up the game, uh, the game space and, and create and, and great experiences for gamers. And they'll need publishers more than ever. Um, and I, and I think, I think we're well positioned to take advantage of that. And, you know, games like Godfall and Tribes of Midgard, and we got a few others that we're really excited about that, that kind of manifest from that. Right. And Tim, and maybe Tim, you could also speak to like, not only opportunity you see, but also in terms of why did you start a new company to go after the opportunity that you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, clearly, there's a need for more great real-time strategy games, so so that's one very specific opportunity. But I was I was actually gonna layer on because I I think great observations uh, already. But the importance of user generated content and just the impact that user generated content has had on pc and games as a whole um, really seems to be escalating I, you know you look at moba as a genre you look at battle royale as a genre uh, you look at auto battlers as a genre like there, there are so many significant trends in gaming that have come out of mods um, and certainly the popularity of roblox of, of minecraft like user generated content um, it's kind of been uh, little 
paid attention to it, but ultimately it has had just this massive impact on the direction of popular genres. So uh, RTS, in addition to being my favorite genre and, and clearly something that I want to see more of, um, has always been intertwined with user-generated content and uh, tools to create user-generated content for Warcraft 3, for example, um, you know, facilitated the creation of the Defense of the Ancients mod and, and the creation of MOBAs. So that's definitely something um, that we're going to try to continue with our game. But uh, but yeah, just uh, I, you know, real-time strategy as a genre is one of those early PC genres that has continued to stay popular, but um, has been underserved. And so we're uh, starting a new team and a new endeavor to, to try to build the next great RTS. Got it. And maybe just as a somewhat of a follow-up question, we could actually dive a little bit deeper into whether it's specific emerging trends or even emerging technologies that are going to potentially unlock new opportunities. So, you know, in the past, it, you know, there could be like some new 3D technology that enables a new type of game or, you know, maybe Tim, you could also speak to why you believe that RTS is uh, a new genre that will be repopularized. But uh, if you guys could speak to, and, you know, or even like the the emergence of frameworks like Unreal or, or Unity, things like that, are, are there any specific trends or technologies that we should be kind of keying in on that would potentially unlock a broader market of some kind? Uh, maybe starting again with you, David. Uh, yeah, I think that obviously engines like Unreal or uh, Unity and things like that have allowed people to make games easier than ever before. Uh, and that's, you know, again, good and bad. <laughs> uh, it's good because we're getting, I think in a lot of ways, we get a lot of high quality products. It used to be like, I remember 15, 20 years ago, like it used to be the, the, the mantra was like, if you make a good game, it'll sell well because uh, there were so many technical disasters <laughs> back then that like a good game is just a game that ran uh so the uh the uh, you know i think that we've come such a long ways now that most games are technically proficient they 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 run well they install well they they you know they're easy to kind of use they have decent interface and direction and stuff like that so that, that kind of mantra of if you make a decent game uh, it'll 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 sell well uh, is gone simply because with the engine and all of these kind of technologies, almost everything is at least decent, at least runs. And um, so I think that that's changed a lot of the industry and I don't see that ever going away. I see that as just being a kind of a focus even more so in the future. There are just too many conveniences uh, associated with an engine. One of the big things is that uh, being able to develop your game and put it on multiple platforms is just so paramount, so important these days uh, because it just increases your revenue so much that uh, having an engine that does a lot of that for you is a huge time saver. And trust me, because <laughs> I have my latest game that I made called It Lurks Below, I made my own engine like a dummy. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it was a big pain in the butt to make it <laughs> work on all these different systems. So, uh, you know, I don't really uh, having that uh, to, you know, in the bag or just, just having that capability right out of the gate has really helped the industry expand and a lot of people make new games and uh, new types of things. So I don't know if that's really an emerging thing that's been, it's been more, it's more important now than it's ever been. And when you get new technologies like ray tracing or something like that, and these engines instantly have the ability to use these technologies, uh, it'll bring them to the forefront even faster. Uh, and I think that uh, that will, you know, these kind of things will propel new types of experiences that we haven't seen so far. And Sean? Uh, this is probably not news, but uh, cross-play, cross-platform, cross-progression. Um, I, I think the game, treating games as community and having the technology to facilitate that is, is the future. Um, I think we've seen a lot of, you know, Fortnite's probably the most visible example of that, but Gation Impact, and there's, I think, 50, 60 some odd games that are taking advantage of that. And I think it'll be table stakes in the future. Um, we have a technology team and suite of services called Spark. I think the manifestation of that externally is called Shift. But that is something that we built uh, for our developers to create those connected experiences. And now it's enabling us to kind of 
create connective tissue between all these desperate platforms and try to create one unified experience. And I think that's just the, you know, the ability not only to reach more gamers, but engage them, and then ultimately you find paths to monetize them. And, and I think that's, that's the trend that will be something that will be necessary for any game company to be competitive. Got it. And, and Tim? Those were both great answers. I, I, um, this is another one that maybe isn't new as an emerging trend, but I think games as a service, um, certainly from a developer perspective, has been hugely impactful and is still something that we're figuring out how to best yeah. take advantage of and best service players um, through that model. Um, I, when I was at Blizzard, we pivoted StarCraft II from more of a box model to constant content delivery. Uh, and I can say for a production team, that's a shift that is very challenging. But I think for players, um, the rewards are meaningful. Um, and that's definitely something that we're going to continue to explore at Frost Giant. And I think the industry as a whole, um, there's still a lot of innovation and player value um, that's yet to be discovered there. Yeah, Tim, 100%. We've <laughs> called it games as a hobby. It's been something we've been doing for over a decade. It's kind of the more consumer-facing friendly version of that term and like borderlands 2 still has over a million monthly active users and you know we we have it doesn't have a traditional gas model but we you know continually fit content i think they're like 16 dlc packs so so having the the ability to engage players over time and then ultimately find paths to monetize them is is, is i think table is also going to be something that most companies need to figure out just the manifestation of it is in loot boxes or subscription services or whatever i think it's depending on the customer you're trying to serve, right? You're, you're, you're looking at RTS customers. We're creating Home Rule 3, uh, you know, which is a you know, space RTS that are you know, iconic franchise. So you know, they're gonna re react differently than say, you know, a Fortnite fan to, to those types of uh, mechanisms. So you really gotta be thoughtful about who your customer is when you kind of deploy those models. But when you have an engaged fan base that loves your game, they want more of it. And you just wanna find a great way of feeding them that content in a way that's economical. Yeah, I think it also goes beyond just that, though, is that because the uh, industry is just so competitive right now, uh, when there are, if you look at across mobile, console, PC, everything or whatever, there's a thousand games released a week. Yeah. And so it, it's hyper competitive. <laughs> and, uh, and because of that, once you have customers, uh, you got to cling on to them for dear life, uh, simply because they're, you know, it's just so hard to get customers because of the competition. So having more games as a service, having these kind of content updates that, or things, reasons for people to come back to your game over and over and over again, ensures your ability to have a customer to sell to whatever and monetize in some kind of way. And, and uh, it's a lot easier to, to do that than it is to get new customers. And so it's a lot less risky. And, uh, and so it's really important to make sure that in today's kind of game, that if you have a hit that you have ways to kind of keep those people coming back uh, because it is a lot easier and a lot more economical to, uh, to focus on that than it is to try something new. Yeah, and maybe Sean and Tim sounds like both of you guys are working on RTS. Is there? Can you guys speak to why we haven't seen like a big new RTS in a while? Like, and Tim, what are what are you specifically seeing as like the the opportunity right now? All right, I'll, I'll jump in first. It's fascinating to me um, the perception around RTS. I guess um, having seen the back end numbers at Blizzard. Um, you know, there's this tremendously engaged player base around RTS, uh, and they didn't go anywhere. Like they have stayed with RTS. Um, but what did happen is other genres came along that surpassed the popularity of RTS. And so, um, by comparison, there's a perception that RTS declined when it really didn't. Like there is still an audience there that loves this genre, and that still today, like StarCraft II, is a 10 year old game, um, and it has this amazingly engaged player base. Um, but what did happen was the popularity of these other genres, um, it distracted publishers and developers to a great extent. Um, there, there is a phenomenon of chasing the latest hot thing. And you know we've just seen it with Battle Royale. Um, we see it with every new genre that crops up or even every new successful title that really breaks out. Um, so I think what's needed is somebody to make another great RTS. And I think that same attention and excitement will come back. Um, and we see that sort of cyclical nature with all kinds of other genres. Um, so I, I absolutely think there's an opportunity there for RTS. 
And then in terms of genre, oh, sorry, Sean, did you, do you want to also comment on that? Uh, it's hard to argue at that point. I, <laughs> I, I concur. You know, I think, I think uh, publishers would fall in love with the kind of big and sexy trends when there's, you know, really large and significant engaged fan bases and genres that, that are left, left untapped. I mean, those from a business perspective actually sound really smart. Um, but with Homeworld, it was something that, you know, most of the studio had played back when it was, you know, created by Relic and, and something we wanted to continue on. And, and when, when Blackbird and our, us got together and thought of what Homeworld 3 could be, it got us really excited. So it made a ton of sense. And, and we know that fan base is there and they're still playing the classic titles. So hopefully we're able to bring something to the market that will um, justify its existence. And, and hopefully we're able to continue on that franchise. And we're also pairing it with a, a mobile title, a free to play mobile title, which is a new experience. So we're not, we're trying to give them that premium experience that they're going to get uh, from, you know, Patricia for PC title, but also give them something new that they can uh, take in with their, on their phone. So, um, so I agree with Tim, his points were just spot on. So nothing more to add than that. Is Blackbird yeah. also doing the mobile SKU? Well? No, no, we're, 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 you know, we have a mobile first studio out of Germany called Stratosphere that we're working with there and they're huge home world fans. You'd be surprised how many there are. So uh, they were passionate about the IP as well, as well as we were and we thought, uh, you know, setting up the, the Homeworld 3 with a free-to-play game that can kind of lead into it could bring broaden the audience and, and potentially, uh, you know, get people excited about the, the launch for the, 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 the sequel. And in terms of genres, are there any other sort of emerging genres? Like, you know, certainly it seems like Mafia is starting to get a little bit popular, but maybe other genres that'll come back as well uh, besides RTS? I think uh, what's going on with Star Citizen is it's it's been playing out for a long time, but I think space sims uh, are are a thing that's on the way back. Uh, I, I'm eager to see adventure games come back in, in new forms, and certainly stuff has happened here and there. But uh, yeah, what else? Tactical strategy games, uh, XCOM style. I think there's tons of opportunity there. there. There's so many great genres like this that are fertile. Um, for updates and for growth. Yeah, I, I don't know. This would be kind of the genre, but more narrative-based experiences, ones that kind of lean on, lean forward on story and 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 that that pillar. I think it's kind of been left behind on, with a lot of the trends around, you know, free-to-play gas games that have kind of very light meta, and then it's really about the gameplay. I think I think there's games out there that can really win with with story and engaging people with 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 that. I think that uh, it reminds me a little, are talking about, you know, the, the, oh, RTS is dead, which is kind of a joke. It reminds me a lot of the, a uh, long time ago when I was pitching Diablo to a bunch of publishers and they say RPGs are dead. Uh, so the, uh, you know, and it only just takes the right title to come around to make a genre kind of emerge or become popular again. Uh, and uh, so I think th that, there's a lot of great genres out there that are untapped and maybe we've experienced in the past for people that have been in the industry of play games for a long time, basically the old people in the <laughs> industry. And, uh, and they, that, uh, that we remember a lot of these titles that, uh, that had just great creativity and, uh, and great, and great reach, but are kind of untapped these days. And I think that, uh, that it's, again, it just takes one title to make, a, to make, something super popular and uh, and that uh, hap we see it happen all the time. Right. And so I thought the next question I can ask you guys, and especially uh, Dave and Sean, since you guys are also on the publishing side, but, you know, in, certainly on the mobile side, mobile game publishing has been all over the place and has, hasn't been very successful. But on the PC side, could you talk about how the model has changed the current model and what is it like in terms of the key value or why you would want to work with a publisher maybe david and sean you guys could talk about what you guys are doing and then after that maybe tim you could talk about what would it take for you to go with a publisher instead of self-publishing but maybe starting with you david sure uh I think that uh, publishing in general is really important these days uh because like i had said earlier there's so many games released uh, every week it's really hard to stand out it's really hard to get any kind of coverage it's really hard to uh do, because a lot of the websites and a lot of the press coverage and things like that revolve around their numbers and uh uh you know they have to do something that's popular and the popular things are the things that generate revenue so trying to break into that popular stance 
it's really difficult as a small developer and indie developer or things like that, uh, doing something you know, having a publisher that is behind you that allows you to uh, to get to break through the noise and be able to hear, you know, be able to get attention on your game is just so, so important. There are so many great games that are that are kind of hidden gems uh, because they're because nobody knows about them. Uh, and that uh, that happens all the time. So I think publishing right now uh, as a as a game developer, publishing looks great because it I believe that with publishers information, you know, their help that they can sell more copies than the cut that they're going to take or whatever. That's that that's the the hope, at least. Um, and so I think that right now it's uh, it's really important. Uh, also, with our, our the publishing company that I created, Skystone, uh, we're not just doing the regular traditional publishing things, which are very helpful and, and really great. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but also uh, uh, we're doing something a little bit more. We're making it kind of, it's first off, it's kind of a developer led publisher. So that's very different than a lot of publishers. I've been there, I go through it. I've been through it many times. I know how it works. I know, you know, I can give you, and that's really the biggest thing is that I can give you tips, right? I, I go in and I get into the nitty gritty of the game and give feedback and know uh, through my vast experience of just being in the industry so long, uh, like, pitfalls and things like that that especially younger developers run into uh and i think that that uh that's something that i think could separate a lot of publishers in the future is their ability to have done that before and understand the entire process uh has a strong upper hand versus people that are that are maybe just uh, looking at numbers and things like that which happens a lot john yeah, um, I think you probably stole a little bit of my thunder there, but yeah, the, ampl <laughs> the amplification is a, is a big part, right? Cutting through the clutter, um, you know, Gearbox, uh, the brand carries uh, some weight with it and people pay attention to things we bring to market. And for example, when we announced Homeworld uh, Ho uh, Risk of Rain 2, along uh, the launch of that, along with Borderlands 3, we were able to sell a million units in the first month. And, I, and that game was already in incredible shape when we met the Hopu guys and they absolutely could have gone it alone because the first game was such a success, but they realized that we could help amplify their efforts and kind of reach more players. And the next piece is the, the reach is like getting into all the places where gamers are, you know, smaller publishers can't do that. They're, they don't have the ability to put a game on a box on a shelf anymore. And we, we can, so that's huge. And the second piece that David said, it's, is we're, we're a publisher born of developers. Like our core team are all guys who have shipped AAA games over the last three to five years. We have the ability to provide guidance and mentorship to these smaller, younger teams so they could focus purely on the game and, and help and help guide them through that process um, since they've done it. And, you know, a lot of publishers have folks that used to have done publishing, you know, making games, but they've been in, in those seats not too long ago. And that's a huge differentiation. And having that credibility and connect, you know, with the develop with other developers is, is help us win uh, the hearts and minds of small, small of, of, of great teams that could have gone with bigger publishers. Um, so I think those that that's a huge win, win for us and a differentiation factor, and it and ultimately helps them focus on what they're great at, and we're able to 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 help amplify their efforts and, and bring it to other places and do port work and all the things that they don't need to worry about. So those are the two big pieces. So really just echoing a lot of what David said. All right, and then Tim, for you, like what would it take for you to work with a publisher, or what would you be looking for? I, I had a prior stint uh, at an independent studio that was primarily uh, advanced against royalty funding, so pu publishing deals. And uh, I still have PTSD from that, I, I won't <laughs> lie. Uh, but the, the world has changed. And I, I think the rise of developer-led publishers is a tremendous thing. Um, you know, Both these guys are doing it. Epic is doing it. Dreamhaven was just announced. Like, uh, it, it is a new approach um, and thought process for publishing um, to have developer-led publishers. So I'm really excited about that. I, I also think the rise of venture capital funding for game studios, which is a relatively recent thing, uh, has changed the landscape a lot that a lot of deals are, they're almost more distribution deals than traditional publishing deals in that the product gets substantially finished before a publisher gets involved. 
But at the end of the day, like my core competency is as a developer, it is not doing go to market. Um, and I'm used to working inside of big publishers where we have brand management, we have PR, we have uh, CRM, you know, we have QA, localization, customer support, like all of these services that a publisher provide provides typically. And those are not quick to build. They're not inexpensive to build. They're hard to build well. Um, so I see a lot of value uh, at the go-to-market phase from a developer perspective in working with a publisher, particularly with how global the market is now. Um, so it's not a tough sell um, to convince me that there are benefits to working with publishers. I think the nature of those deals and frankly, the economics of those deals have changed to be more developer favorable, both because of developer-led publishers like these guys uh, and because of the rise of venture capital funding for game studios. So I think it's headed in a really good direction, but it is still kind of in a state of flux and in transition. So we're interested to see how it evolves in the next few years while we're still in development. Yeah, it's spot on, Tim. Yeah, we're, 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 you know, we get the benefit of having games that we could actually touch and play. And, you know, when we, the team puts their dev goggles on, not me, but other people, they could see where the big, big 10 game is trending and, and really realize what, you know, what they think that could be and then, then lean in. And since we've worked with a lot of publishers historically, we, you know, we're, we're trying to give the developers better economics from dollar one than they would find in any other place because we just think incentivizing the team and having them feel the, the success of their titles early is massively important. You know, we feel it here at Gearbox uh, every day when we create a title with, with 2K is, you know, feeling the success of our game sooner means a lot for the talent. And so, and then ultimately more transparency in the process and sales and everything. Um, you know, we're not a black box or, you know, an open book in that regard. So I think all those things, uh, as you said, really create a great opportunity for publishers and, and finding great games and, and teams and hopefully giving them the upside they deserve from the creations that they make. And do you guys have any thoughts in terms of some of the other kind of third-party publishers out there, whether it's Epic? And increasingly, I'm hearing a lot about actually Chinese publishers who are pretty, from what I hear, aggressively funding. Is that a way? Should we be thinking about that as a potential way of unlocking the Chinese market? Or I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on any of the other guys out there. I guess, uh, yeah, from, from my <laughs> I'm side. I'm not going to go first yet again. So <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> oh, good. Uh, it's so hard to map out the landscape in other regions. And, you know, we, we just did our studio announce uh, a month ago. And um, we've been reached out to by various players in different regions. And, and just um, learning the landscape and learning how things are evolving because it things aren't just evolving here in, in the US, they're evolving around the world. Um, we're, we're taking a very agnostic approach though, because I, I think, for example, um, streaming, the streaming services um, that are competing with each other right now probably have some long-term impact on game distribution, understanding what that looks like, understanding how this console generation is gonna shake out. Um, you know, there's so much that is constantly changing, but um, reaching markets like China, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Middle East, North Africa, you know, Brazil, India, all of these markets that are exploding right now um, does take partners who have expertise in those regions um, and understanding that uh, and, and understanding those landscapes, like who, who are the best partners to have. It's difficult for a small developer like us. So we're trying to be circumspect and thoughtful about how we approach that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge. David or Sean? I'm trying to parse with part of the question I should answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I think I think when we think of Asia and other markets, it's similar, right? We we don't have boots on the ground there, and that's crucial, even even as a publisher in the West. And I act, and I think Chinese, uh, you know, dominant com you know game companies like Tencent and NetEase are looking looking at our market and saying, should they build it or buy it or rent it, or what's the best path to uh, tapping into our audience? Because you know, capital doesn't necessarily mean success, and um, so we're. You know we're, we're we're happy to partner with them and find you know uh, win wins and we've found games that have been funded or partially funded from Chinese companies 
that unlock that region that we get to participate in, and they and they get a, a team here in the West that's going to help realize the their investment with those teams. So there's a lot of win wins there, uh, you know. So but we're not, you know, we're not sitting there and seeing them as competition. It's just really finding the the, you know, the optimal path per per product and seeing and and so we're we're evaluating as it comes because it's as Tim said, it's it, the landscape is changing. There was a minute there where every Chinese publisher had a platform and they're looking for content and they're trying to fill that pipeline and then that pipeline got shut down and then everything stopped for a year. So it's uh, it's it's always changing. You just kind of have to just roll with it, I guess. Yeah, I think that in general, the uh, Chinese publishers have been here for a long time. <laughs> uh, they, uh, you know, they've been funding things for years and years and years. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't think that it's really any news. The, I mean, the big thing for me about Chinese game development in general is the fact that it's finally starting to make some traction here in the U.S. I mean, uh, uh, there are now some hit games coming out of China, which hasn't happened before. And I think that uh, that's more of an emergence out of China than, than any kind of funding or anything like that. The fact that uh, there are going to be, I think, a wave of, of games that come out of China that are high quality, fun games that uh, that everybody is going to enjoy playing, similar to the what we've seen come out of early, very early in the 80s from Japan and then uh, eventually Korea. And now uh, I think China is just on the edge of really kind of breaking through and making a bunch of hit games here uh, that are kind of worldwide hits. Got it. And Tim, you mentioned the streaming platforms and kind of these cloud-based gaming platforms as having potentially having an impact on the PC gaming market. So could maybe all of you, but maybe starting with you, Tim, talk about what are your thoughts in terms of whether it's Google Stadia or Amazon Luna? What do you guys think is it? Because it doesn't seem like at least currently that any of those guys have seemed to have gotten any traction. But if you have any general thoughts on that and then... To your point, Tim, what would be the potential impact to PC gaming if these things do become successful? Yeah, I think it's it's too soon to call. Um, and and obviously with uh, OnLive and Gaikai, like there there have been some um, some past efforts in these directions. But you look at the players who are in this now; uh, they have the necessary capital to deploy the infrastructure. And in many cases, they already have the infrastructure there. Uh, but they also have the necessary capital to play the long game. Um, and I think they will do that. Uh, and I know there's been some skepticism, especially voiced uh, by Take-Two on um, just future of streaming as uh, being impactful, but I, I wouldn't count these guys out. Um, I, I also look at some of the assets that they have, um, it, you know, Amazon with Twitch, uh, Google with YouTube, um, there, there are so many interesting uh, connections that they can make and kind of seamless transitions from places where the community, the fan community around games are already inhabiting um, to seamlessly get into games from those platforms feels powerful to me. Um, so I, I, you know, I think the, the days of a disc with a game demo coming with PC gamer or uh, computer gaming world. I mean, we're, we're entering an era now where you could watch a streamer who's just exposed you to some interesting new game and immediately transition into trying that game. That's powerful. Um, so I, I think it will be very impactful um, who, who the winner is and exactly what's the business model that strikes the right chord with consumers because that, that seems to be a big part of what Stadia hasn't figured out yet. Um, I don't know the answers to those, but but I think they will get answered. Um, so it'd be fascinating to see. Okay, Sean. Yeah, I think Tim, your your assessment is pretty spot on with what, the way we think about it. Um, we're we're on Stadia. We're you know we're, we're already kind of experimenting in that space with Borderlands Three, and 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 I and I think we'll continue to to as a as a developer, want to understand how what it means to be on those platforms. Um, in terms of our like business attitude towards, it's too early to tell. I think thinking them as a replacement for you know consoles and PCs today is probably the wrong thinking. Um, in the long term, as you said, their ability to potentially bring in new customers in a frictionless way through some of the unique attributes of their ecosystem is really exciting. Like the ability to try a game 
and then and then decide if you want to buy it or not on the fly instantly without having to have a rig is is pretty powerful. And once they figure that part out, um, I think the mistake is is you know thinking of it as a replacement for kind of the current gen and, and next gen hardware, and because gamers are going to ultimately critique it that way. Um, but I think it has a long term benefit to the entire industry. So we definitely want to understand it and be ready to take advantage of it as as that kind of maturizes. Yeah. And maybe yeah, David, you that... can respond. And if if you could also like you or uh, others, are there any additional capabilities as well that streaming provides? I, I know Tim, you mentioned kind That's... of YouTube or whatever, but you know I've heard of maybe like having like a thousand person battle royale or something like that. But if you have any thoughts on that as well, uh, David. Yeah, I think that that's what I was going to say is that uh, I think that one of the things about the streaming services, is the thing that's going to separate it is the same kind of things that happen with like mobile games. You don't, you can't bring a console game exactly to mobile game. You know, it, it, they, they have, they have a different way that you use your mobile phone. And so the streaming services, I don't know if there's been a game yet that really takes advantage of it being a streaming service. And uh, so if there is something out there that can be designed so that you can take advantage of the cool parts of a streaming service to make it integrated with the gameplay in such a way that, hey, I can take it from my desktop to my phone to, you know, wh whatever I want to do. And I, you know, without any kind of downtime or downloading or anything like that, there's like all sorts of things that maybe that are, have this untapped potential uh, that creates a new type of experience that makes streaming a different way to deliver games to people. And that, that I think uh, is one way that it could succeed if uh, besides the traditional, hey, we're just gonna, you know, not have your games installed. Uh, you know, which is a, a benefit, that's, that's for sure, but creating an experience that specifically takes advantage of some of the parts of uh, a streaming service, I think, is uh, the key to making it really kind of a long-term uh, business opportunity for game developers in general. Yeah, very curious to see how, what Stadia and Amazon do with first-party titles and, and right. how they leverage that technology to create something truly unique, and that will right. then spur on other developers to, to take on the mantle. Yeah, I look at um, just from developer perspective, access to potentially more compute than a player has on their desk. Um, there are interesting things with respect to AI and machine learning that could come out of that. Um, if it's a closed ecosystem streaming game um, where all the players are on a streaming service, it takes away client hacking as a risk um, for a competitive esport like an RTS, for example, uh, there's real value there. Uh, client server model or even peer-to-peer -peer model networking where all of the computers are in the same rack, um, like the low latency that you get out of that and the high bandwidth that you get out of that creates some really interesting game design um, potential. So I, I think there's a lot that can come out of this down the road. There's thinking to do about how exactly to take advantage of all those assets. Yeah, we'll see what Mail.ru does. You know, I think, <laughs> I think that's an inter that market might be the first to, to get some traction there. So yeah, we'll see. And David, one of the things you mentioned earlier was cross-platform. So I thought we could talk about that next in terms of, you know, how should, whether it's as a publisher, as a developer, how should we be thinking about cross-platform opportunities? Certainly there's, kind of market expansion, but also the potential of, you know, one for some multiplayer games by being cross-platform, you could potentially increase CCU help matchmaking and things like that. But in terms of like where you see the, the opportunities or how we should be thinking about cross-platform, if you guys have any specific thoughts on that, that would be great. Maybe starting with you, David, since you first brought that up earlier. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I think that was Sean that did it, but the, oh, uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to push off my answer because I don't have one, but the, uh, the, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, it, it's really important, obviously. I think that, uh, it, the big problem always with cross platform has been getting all these different publishers to agree to each other, right? You know, how, who's going to get the money? How, that's, that's what it comes down to. So, uh, uh, 
as gamers, the, we all want this, right? But the uh, but then the businesses need to work out how it actually happens, and that that's the biggest challenge. I think that technically it's not that big of a challenge because a lot of times, like in a client server game, it doesn't matter, you know, how the clients what your client is, whether or not it's uh, you know, a console or whether or not it's PC or Mac or a phone or whatever, it's like the same kind of packets are coming in and out, uh, then then it's not really that big of a deal. But the uh, the it really just comes down to the business and uh, how, how that works. And that's been the biggest prohibitive thing uh, in the past traditionally. Don? Um, I think I already did my little diatribe on, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's crucially important for the industry to figure this out. It's, you know, like, as, as David said, there's a lot of business considerations, but this is great for gamers and it's great for game makers and publishers. So I, I can't imagine it not being something that gets figured out in the near term where Matt, we're assuming it is going to be. So we're investing in more tools and technology on our end to make our experiences as, as connected and, is possible in the future. Like that's for us, it's 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 a it's going to happen, and we have to assume so in the future. Right, and Tim, maybe for you, and also maybe to the point about if you're creating a competitive RTS, like how actually viable is the cross-platform play, just given the you know the amount of control and stuff you have against the different platforms. Yeah, I'm in kind of a crazy genre when it comes to cross-platform because RTS has such uh, a tie to the way that you control the game. Uh, and if you take away mouse and keyboard, it's not clear that the experience is as compelling. Um, and I think, you know, there, there were similar feelings about first-person shooters back in the day, and clearly shooters have successfully made the transition, but I, I don't think anybody's truly cracked um, the best way to adapt RTS to other platforms. And certainly there's been, you know, Halo Wars 2 and, and our uh, EA had several titles that also came out on console, but just the performance relative to PC RTS um, hasn't been the same. And I think player perception uh, hasn't been as positive. So, so I'm not sure what the answer is um, in terms of the best way to adapt to RTS, but from a player perspective, of course, and, and even from a developer perspective, um, just wanting to have the best experience, uh, it's clearly ideal to be able to connect across platform and have uh, a fun experience without having to think about whether my friends own an Xbox or a PlayStation or any other platform. Great. And so uh, the next question I want to ask you, and, and hopefully it's not too sensitive, but just as a, you know, really diehard old school Blizzard fan. Uh, some of the folks I talked to, and I've got some friends that work at Blizzard, but there has been, it seems, a lot of concern about Blizzard. And just to be clear, I mean, I am a diehard fan. There, There isn't another company's games I've played more than Blizzard. So the concern kind of comes from a good place. But, you know, in terms of like, uh, you know, David and Tim, both of you guys have, have worked there and have history there. Could you guys comment in terms of like, what are your current thoughts in terms of Blizzard, future prospects, things like that? And then maybe Sean, I know you've worked at Riot. Maybe we can get your perspective in terms of Riot. But uh, in terms of the Blizzard part, maybe starting with you, David, since you are the OG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh uh, first off, I haven't I haven't worked there in twenty years, so it's the uh, you know it's a little bit weird. Uh, but uh, the company itself is changed dramatically, uh, and that's just what happens oftentimes over time. Uh, companies change. Uh, most of the people that were there when I started the company were are gone. Right there, they it's everybody from. Mike Morheim to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, myself, like everybody, all the kind of the OG people, a great majority of them are gone. There are still some, but there are very few compared to, to the people that were there. So the company's changed a lot. Um, uh, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, obviously there is concern. Uh, I would say that, uh, that fans are concerned. 
Uh, but that's mainly because I think of the recent track record of Blizzard and the products that they put out. The Warcraft 3 uh, expansion did not go well. Uh, it was not received well. It did not perform well. It did not, uh, the consumers were really unhappy. Uh, and uh, so I think that that, you know, being the last kind of taste in their mouth with what happened at Blizzard uh, and, you know, just kind of reinforces this opinion of why have all these people left uh, and uh, why are, you know, when what's coming out now and how can, you know, this is kind of a, a mess and they've made some missteps, you know, between the, you know, Diablo Immortal announcement to uh, to the Warcraft 3 expansion, you know, the remaster, I'm sorry, not the expansion, the remaster, mm -hmm. uh, that, that those have been uh, those have been some missteps that uh, that we'll see whether or not they can recover. I, I would imagine they can. They're a massive force, so I wouldn't count them out. Uh, and they got a lot of talented people over there. But uh, can they learn some of the lessons and uh, and put a better foot forward? I would guess they can. But uh, but we'll, time will tell. Yeah, worth uh, calling out that I'm a, a more recent uh, Blizzard person and, and left more recently, so I didn't even get to see um, from the inside the era that David did. Um, I, I actually started my career at Activision, and, and Activision owns Blizzard now, um, and so I, I had a chance to experience how Activision approaches game development and, and Activision has had incredible business success and made really great games. So I, I take nothing away from Activision. They definitely do approach development differently um, than Blizzard. And even over the period of time that I was there, I think there were some changes um, and those changes, they weren't good. They weren't bad. They were just changes. Blizzard is a, uh, evolving like any company does. And so um, I think it's fair to say that it is a different place, but it is still absolutely a place that has incredibly talented people, um, you know, just this legacy of great universes, um, legacy of building player experiences that inspire fandom like very few other companies can. I don't think that's going to change. Um, and I think the next Diablo, I think the next Overwatch, uh, you know, the future of Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, these, these are things that excite me as a player. Um, and I think that there will absolutely be home runs there. So um, I, it's totally fair to say that it's different. Um, and there's, there's good and bad that comes with that. Um, certainly mistakes have been made. And I, I think everybody, uh, you know, over the course of the evolution of their companies or, or their careers for that matter makes mistakes. The important thing is to learn from them. Uh, and I think Blizzard is trying very hard to do that. Um, I really have just tremendous affection for Blizzard as a company and, and that hasn't changed with me being on the outside. I'm looking forward to playing everything they make. Got it. And before kind of jumping to you, Sean, with Riot, maybe while we're talking about Blizzard and Tim, to your point about the differences between Blizzard and Activision, this is just kind of one question I have. Maybe maybe this is a dumb question, but it seems like part of the Activision formula is to create a more repeatable, predictable process in terms of revenue and game products. And so, and they've done that, for example, with the Call of Duty franchise, right? And they've got like, or they had three studios. I don't know if it's now like two and a half where... You know, they're working on three-year pipelines, basically, so that every year you've got, you know, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, Cold, you know, uh, uh, Cold War, whatever. So every year you have something like that. But on the Blizzard side, is this is it a dumb question or kind of dumb way to think about a franchise like Diablo, where you could have, you know, Diablo, uh, Modern Warfare? black magic one two three four and having like a new diablo every year or every other year or something like that or why would that not be the right way to think about it or i don't, I don't know if you guys want to <laughs> comment on that it ties a uh, little bit to the games as a service conversation too i think um and and i don't know the right answer here but it is interesting that the activision model um does annualize new releases to a certain extent wow does that not quite annualized, but maybe 18 to 24 month eyes, um, it, you know, is that better than one thing that evolves more granularly? I don't, I don't know the answer, but um, they are distinctly different approaches. I don't know, David was going to say something. 
Oh, I was just going to say that uh, that the kind of tradi Blizzard still is working in kind of the traditional model in a lot of ways that they have the, hey, let's make the the game and then we're going to sell an expansion or a second expansion. And that's kind of like the way that they they go about their business. Uh, and I think that the industry has changed a lot uh, and that uh, that most modern companies don't go about it that way anymore. They do. Oh, we're going to have all sorts of DLCs or we're going to have, you know, a game more of a game of, as a service kind of thing and have quarterly updates. And they've kind of done that with some of the things like having seasons in Diablo and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I think that that will definitely be a guide for the way that they make the game, make games in the future, that it's going to be, the things are going to be different. Uh, and I think that uh, that uh, they can see that and uh, everybody, everybody can see the way that the industry is changing. And so I think that, you know, I don't necessarily expect them to kind of go about the business the same way they did in the past where it's been, hey, we're going to have this one game and it's going to take us 10 years to make the next game or whatever uh the uh i think that uh that things will change but i don't think they'll ever get to the point where they're going to do it annually so uh, i mean maybe they will but it'll be a long time from now if they if that did happen so uh the, more likely it's doing things like uh, like having diablo 4 and diablo immortal where they're giving different experiences on different platforms and things like that is is more of kind of the direction i see them going but this is all speculation because i don't work there and haven't worked there in a long time and then, Sean, in terms of future prospects for Riot, what are your thoughts? And then maybe you could also speak to like this. It seemed like from whether it was this year or last year, there was a change, right? Where before you didn't see, I, I know Riot was working on a lot of new game to, new games in terms of having them in development. But now they're finally seeing like they've caught their stride in terms of launching stuff. But if you have any thoughts on on Riot. Yeah, I, I, I was there handful of years ago and I wasn't there very super long but when I was there I saw a lot of the products that that are now in the market so you know we were very happy for my friends there that they put the ass in riot games and and I, I think it was just a matter of time they're just so incredibly talented and passionate gamers that it was just a matter of time before they figured out you know what it would take to get one of those games out and once they realized okay that wasn't so bad let's go do it again and now they've got a bunch of new products in the market and the, got a league on mobile and so many great ways in which they're kind of expanding their brand and tapping into new genres. So, um, you know, I think they're just getting started right now. And, you know, I think, I think they now figured out what it takes to create new IP, create new games and get it through, you know, their processes to get it, get into market. Right. It took us like five years to do Borderlands three, you know, making games is hard. And, and especially when you're trying to innovate and, and uh, and top what the, the the prior game was in our case was Borderlands 2 which was a massively successful game and and expectations are incredibly high so all those things are being factored in not, not only from a business perspective but like you know the people who are making the game which is the most important part and so um yeah I think I think Riot is on is on a tear right now and I just expect them to continue to be so it's a, such a great and talented place so I'm, I'm rooting for them I'm rooting for Blizzard as a fan as well, right? You know, the growing pains and the transition they're going through, I, I think it's, I think they have to, and, and some of that's going to be painful, but ultimately, uh, hopefully it, it leads to more great games for, for the industry. So definitely fans of both companies and root them on. I want to echo that positivity about Riot as well. Riot's one of the investors in Frost Giant, and I've had a chance to interact uh, with some of the guys running their R&D group specifically, uh, Tom Cadwell and John David Perry, and those are just incredibly smart and circumspect people. I have a lot of uh, belief in the future of what Riot's doing. I'm excited to see um, what comes from all of the work that they're putting in. Awesome. And I thought like maybe the next topic to talk about would be this uh, conversation that you kind of mentioned, Tim, in terms of the games as a service live operating model and associated with that typically and I'm coming from more of the mobile side, is the kind of free-to-play model. And just speaking honestly, having worked at, you know, when I was at Sega before and meeting a lot of the more the PC console, the HD guys, you know, at least in my experience, the kind of pushback I got a lot was that free-to-play was a little bit of a dirty word. Like have that model in terms of, um, you know, like, if, if I mentioned that, oh yeah, there are players that spend $1,000 or actually there were games I've worked on where 
players spend a hundred thousand dollars in a month, and it's like, oh my god, that's you know, it's like get away from me, you dirty free to play person. But I, I thought maybe we could talk about that in terms of, and especially since we've seen uh, games like Genshin Impact and games from China that embrace the free to play model more. What are your thoughts in terms of both the the shift in terms of PC games to more of a live operating model? And uh, just the just whether PC developers can embrace that or how they would be viewing free to play. And since Tim, you brought it up, maybe we could start with you. Definitely, yeah, I, I have thoughts. Uh, so I I had the uh, experience of transitioning start to from traditional box model to free to play, and there was so much debate. Um, inside the company and inside the team over whether that was a desirable thing to do. I think there is negative baggage with free to play because there are some practices to encourage monetization that are not necessarily positive. Um, introducing player frustration so that they're encouraged to monetize to get past that frustration. Um, you know, Taking advantage of gambling mechanics is something that's uh, inspired a lot of debate. I, I don't think I have a strong opinion one way or the other, but I, I think it's clear that you have to approach these things very sensitively. Um, pay to win is a topic that you hear a lot about uh, in the context of free to play. When we transition start to over, amazingly, the community was the source of the suggestion. Like they felt that lowering the barrier to entry would bring more players into the game. And it turns out they were right because absolutely the number of players in the game went up after we went free to play. Um, so there are very good things about free to play. Uh, there's even uh, a theory that the um, success of games like Warcraft three um, was driven to a great extent by piracy, which effectively is the precursor to free to play. Um, so just, you know, Players being able to get access to your game as a game creator is desirable. It's a thing that we want. Um, we tried to approach the transition in a way that didn't introduce new mechanics that created frustration. It just took content uh, that you used to pay for, um, made some of it available for free and some of it available for purchase. And I'm not sure that's the exact best model for every game or the right way to approach free to play. But I, I think the key takeaway for me is it's possible to implement free to play in a way that doesn't feel bad to players um, and trying to approach it from the outset, optimizing for the best player experience um, seems really important. Um, clearly we still have to make money um, and it's not in the player's best interest if the game isn't financially viable because they're going to stop getting support and stop getting content. Um, but there are ways to balance these two things. And um, yeah, we're, we're trying to be very thoughtful about that as we consider the business model for what we do next. John? Yeah, I, I, I think we're, you know, we're in the entertainment business, not the addiction business. So, so free to play gives us the ability to, to entertain more players. And if you're player centric and player focused, that gives our creators the opportunity to ultimately achieve their goals, which is to have more people playing the games they create and hopefully enjoying them. And um, so I think there's a, there's a nuance to, to how you go about making those experiences great. We ultimately want to over deliver where people, they do buy something that we create, they feel like they could, they got the better end of the bargain. And, you know, and I think we've historically done that with our you know, DLC packs and all the things we've done with the games we have, where we put it, put in way more value into the things we deliver. And we're gonna continue that ethos as we kind of explore new business models. But you know, I'm, I, I don't think we're allergic to it. I, I think you know, at the end of the day, I think we're, we're embracing it and we're excited for the opportunity to tap into new audiences and new gamers, be here in the US or globally that that, that business model provides, as long as we do it in a way that doesn't feel icky, <laughs> as Tim said. It's, uh, which there are great examples out there. And if you're testing your game and being player focused, that you're, you're gonna find a path there. And, um, you know, thankfully we're, you know, a company that's driven primarily to enter for entertainment purposes, not for like pure profit purposes or, or you know, stock price share, et cetera. So we're able to kind of have a better balance there where we don't feel too much pressure to be exploitive. Right, so if I'm hearing you guys correctly, Sean and Tim, it's not so much free to play, but the specific mechanics and the way that you execute your free-to-play monetization 
just so long as it's in a friendly way, not like an addictive, bad way, then you guys are kind of fine with that. Yeah, who wouldn't want millions and millions of people playing their game? I mean, that's, <laughs> right. that's awesome. I think we all want that, right? right, right. You know, yeah. the friction that you create with premium games limits that uh, potential. So if you're able to create a bigger funnel where more people can come and play your game and and that's ultimately the metric we care about is like how many people do we reach and how many do we gratify by by doing that and, and that just gives us more opportunity to do so so definitely not allergic to it it's, it's just just really about implementation of it got it and david and maybe like in terms of like how you might perceive monetization in like a fortnite or a clash royale by supercell i mean are those okay for you or are those kind of more on the too much uh <laughs> this is a really complicated question uh, because uh, there are two hats here. Uh, the, well, three. There's one as a consumer, one as a developer, and one as a businessman. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, the revenue, the, the, the one that makes the most money is the worst, uh, in terms of like, it has the most, you know, the things that are, the reason that these models like the gambling ones exist is because they're making a ton of money. And, uh, and people are literally making billions of dollars a year off of these kind of practices, and they aren't going to go away as long as they're making billions of dollars. And, uh, and so I went through this, I went through this with, I created a game called Marvel Heroes, it was free to play. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it, we came out when we came out, people perceived us as being unfair. It was too expensive. Uh, and so we went through and we changed everything. We changed our prices. We listened to our audience. We made all these different ways to, to earn the characters and things like that. And in the end, everybody felt like, Hey, you guys really reached a great balance. It was, uh, you know, it was you could play the game, you could earn the characters. We got a lot of support. Our actual conversion rate was really high uh, for people that were uh, paying versus uh, just free users uh, was really high. Our lifetime value was really high and things like that. And but in the end, we didn't make all that much money, right? And uh, eventually the company went out of business because uh, because maybe our practices weren't good enough. They're trying to find that right balance is really, really, really difficult. Uh, how much do you charge? How much do you listen to your audience? How much do you, and like, if you make it an unpopular decision, oh, this, this character is gonna be $20, you're gonna get tons of outrage. Oh my God, it's $20, that's an outrage, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, if you, it sells well, then what was the lesson learned there? You've maybe pissed off some of your audience, but you've made a ton of money. And there's like this weird, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. And there's a ton of pressure uh, running a free to play game because it is, you know, under the microscope every day. It's like, how are we doing on our revenue? You know, what's the, what's this month? What's, what are we, what are we doing? What are we doing to make sure that there's something new for people to buy in a, you know, the next month or the next week or whatever it is to try and keep this train going and keep it as a game as a service. So it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and the balance is, is almost impossible. And I'm not really sure whether or not if you make a game that's really friendly to players, you're really hurting your business. And then if you make something that's really helps the business, you're really hurting your players. So I don't, I don't really know the, the balance is very, very tricky. And, uh, it sounds in theory, like you can do it. Uh, but in practice, it's, a very fine line that uh, that you either have a upset audience or you have a maybe not a business. So it's a uh, it's it's tough. You just gotta accept that you're not gonna make everyone happy. You just yeah. have, to have that conclusion already made, and then it's just really about like where is that balance. And I think each company and each product has to kind of make that call. And at the end of the day, if you're not making up money, you're not gonna be able to create content, which the gamers want. So you have to have uh, weight on that side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could dig a little bit deeper in terms of the kind of the shift to a live operating model and, uh, you know, uh, that aspect of this. And, and Tim, did you mention there was for you before there was more of a cultural shift in terms of like uh, whether it's like capabilities or how you think about live operations versus kind of, you know, units sold model. Can you talk about whether, because it does seem like a lot of, you know, HD 
game studios are trying to make that shift. We haven't seen a lot of great success cases except for maybe, I don't know, Warframe. But I, I don't know if, Tim, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I would talk about it first maybe from a production side, just that imagine a culture that took seven and a half years to launch the original game and then two years to launch a couple of expansions each two years moving to delivering a new piece of content every month uh like the production processes the team structure um the strategic planning the qa the localization pipelines like the amount of change that has to happen to accommodate going from traditional box model to continuous delivery of content they're massive um the live operations aspect of providing a high quality of uptime and service um, and not having to take the service down with every update for long. I mean, there's just, there's so much involved in making this transition, but the benefit to players is palpable. Um, you know, we, I love that. I hadn't heard games as a hobby, but I, I love the, uh, the spirit of what's captured in that. I mean, we've, all of us, I think on this call, probably the reason we're making games at all is because games are our hobby. Um, and so this is fulfilling that in a way that we haven't been able to fulfill it before for players by giving them the ability to just constantly engage with content. Um, so I, I think it's really powerful. It, it's also just really difficult. And we had a lot of learnings on the way. Um, I've talked to other teams who have gone through this. Uh, you know, there's some techniques like leapfrog development, having small sub teams that leapfrog each other to produce new content, um, having smaller content drops and then tent pole moments over the course of a year um, that are sort of reacquisition points, but bigger pieces of content or features that happen. Um, it, it does take a lot of strategic planning and it also takes a belief in the long term viability of your game. And I, I look at, um, I think, Riot to call Riot out in a positive way, again, deserves a lot of credit um, for the evolution of League of Legends. I mean, that game from when it started to what it is now, it's just radically different and radically better. Um, and this incremental iterative approach of constant improvement, um, obviously constant content updates, um, has really made something that probably couldn't have been made any other way. Like, I, I don't think you could uh, just raise funding and build League of Legends as it is today. I think it took that feedback loop of being out in the market um, and the time to observe how players are engaging with the game to get it to the point that it is today. So I, I see that as really beneficial and really powerful, not just on the business side, and clearly Riot has done fantastically on the business side, but also from a qualitative perspective, from a player experience perspective. Joe, I, I push back a little bit on your first comment. Like, there's great examples of HD companies that have been able to make that transition. I mean, uh, Rockstar is probably the biggest example of, of how they've been able to create hyper premium experiences and then have a, a gas model and both be extremely successful. Respawn with Apex Legends, Call of Duty, War, you know, they, they now they have premium SKUs and a free to play SKU that then feeds more consumers into their premium experiences. So they're, and, and all of them have to have, you know, different approaches to doing it. And, you know, we made a conscious decision that Borderlands 3 was not going to be a gas game. There was a ton of pressure just from the industry to say, well, that has to be, that's the trend. But the expectations of what we thought our core fan base was, for at least for that particular product, was hyper premium traditional model. And, you know, and, and in terms of introducing something new to them, you need to be conscientious of the customer. And then and ultimately you have to have the team that was ready to pull it off. And and I think Tim kind of articulated what, what those challenges are, so I don't need to repeat them. But um. But you know the transition from like console players become console developers become mobile developers. I think the industry has experienced those transitions and pain multiple times, but they ultimately came up with with better teams and better solutions. So I'm confident you know that trend will continue. That you know traditional HD companies will be able to find their way to exploit different business models in a way that feels good to them and the consumer. And Sean, to your comment about pressure in terms of focusing on the live operated model. Is there a bias or a preference right now for live operated versus kind of units shipped more like the, you know, kind of single player experience type of game? Uh, at Gearbox or uh, the industry at all? Both. Uh, just 
both. Um, no, we, we don't have a bias. I, I, I mean, we're, we're still making hyper premium games like Homeworld 3 and, you know, Borderlands 3 is a great experience, but we're, but we're, you know, our aspirations to go beyond that and entertain more people. So we're going to find new ways of doing that. Like with Homeworld Mobile is a great example of kind of trying out new business models and, and we're not allergic to any of those things. Um, you know, the, the pressure obviously is to create profitable projects that then feed into new profitable projects and, and reward our, our teams along the way. So that that's really our KPIs and, and, and at the end of the day, if we don't have a team that's motivated to create the product, it doesn't matter what metric you use. So, um, so there, the pressure is to evolve and constantly grow, but not to, to, to drop what we're doing and move on. We think our, there's going to be a premium audience uh, forever, and we're going to try to serve them through you know, those types of games. And then we're going to find new ones through different models. And we'll hopefully have a, find a balance there between the two. But we're definitely not abandoning uh, those premium consumers because they're there and, and and I think it's going to continue to grow. I mean, we talked a bit about like, you know, Asia and other markets, like there's more gamers being born today that are evolving into more premium experiences. Like we found that our back catalog on Steam China is like, you know, our Borderlands games are I think the second biggest markets China and those are premium games, right? So there's, doesn't mean you abandon things. You just, I think there's more audience just from the you know, rising tide floats all boats. So we're, we're, there's no strong, there's no one overriding preference for us. Great. And David? Yeah, I am I agree. I think that it, it comes down to individual games. Like if a game is designed to be uh, kind of a uh, games as a service type of game, then those are the ones that fit the best, right? Trying to transition something is the most difficult. It's possible, but it's uh, the most difficult thing to do is yeah. to try and transition from a box product to a, to a games as a service kind of thing. Uh, but I think that I think a lot of a lot of teams now, or a lot of development companies, a lot of publishers, things like that, they're thinking about, hey, before we get too far down the road with this project, what is the kind of the 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 grand vision for whether or not this is going to be kind of a games as a service style game or not? And again, I think that there's an audience for for any of these types of things. It's just like, I don't know, it's a little bit like. Um, uh, the movie industries that you're going to make games for your streaming service and you're going to make games for the cinema. And then this, you know, that that's okay. There's an audience there for, for both. And, uh, and so uh, making sure that you have the, that the, the, whatever model fits the game the best. Uh, that's, that's the important thing. Yep. All right, guys, final question. I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me uh, this long, but, I wanted to talk about actually some of the new games coming from China, probably most notably Black Myth Wukong and Genshin Impact. And there's kind of like this narrative now and kind of this discussion in the industry about a new age of high-end console and PC games coming from China and the advantage that China has because of you know lower cost structure, crunch culture, things like that. Can you guys speak in terms of you know how are you guys viewing the rise, potential rise of PC console games coming from China, and then can you also make a case for us here in Western studios as well? Uh, and maybe starting with you, David. Uh, sure. I think that, as I stated before, that like the rise of the Chinese game is going to be is here, and uh, and they it, they've started to get their first hits, and it's going to continue. Uh, there are going to be a lot of a lot of games coming out of China, and uh, and I don't know if they necessarily have an advantage or disadvantage over other. There's lots of other countries. It's not just China that the, the kind of the game community is emerging. Uh, game development uh, out of Brazil or out of Eastern Europe or like there's a bunch of other places that have lower cost structures and have. Uh, and are going to have um, you know emerging titles, and it's largely because you have things like it, the Unreal Engine or the Unity and things like that that they're able to kind of like leapfrog in their development timeline as to how fast they, they can get things up and running, and they don't need to be as uh, you know technically savvy as we had to be like when we were making our own uh, development machines and making Sega Genesis cartridges. So the uh, the uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, that because of this, that uh, that you're going to see an emergence not just out of China, but out of everywhere. And we're going to see different types of games. We're going to that we've never seen before. We're going to see different perspectives and different kind of experiences. 
Uh, we're going to see, uh, maybe we'll see new business models. Uh, who knows? There's going to be a whole bunch of things that kind of come out of this. And uh, it's really going to be more of a global market than it's ever been. That said, we do have a lot of advantages and name recognition and things like that here in, you know, in the U.S., in, in particular, or in the West, the, uh, where we have games and Blizzard and Riot and like all of these giant co companies have been around for a long time uh, that have this advantage of uh, being able to reach an audience that isn't going to go away, is continuing to grow here in the U.S. and all around the world and uh, are kind of pillars of the industry and they'll have a lot to lean on for a long time. All right, great. Sean? Um, yeah, I, I think the... I think the opportunity is, I don't see it much as a challenge, but an opportunity. They still need to find audiences in, in the in markets outside of the ones that they're you know, being created from. So it gives gives companies like Gearbox and, and others to the opportunity to, to help realize, you know, new games from new markets. And, you know, we've got a couple in the pipeline that are not, you know, from North America that we're excited about from markets that David's mentioned that that are having, you know, talents popping up everywhere. I just see it as an opportunity. Of course, it's going to be competitive. I mean, I think that's just a given. But, um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, I think it's an opportunity too. And, and the more reps they get at creating content, the better they're going to get at it. You know, we just have a head start, but, but I can imagine they'll catch up pretty quickly. All right. And Tim? Yeah, I, I feel like um, a lot of things we touched on, access to engine technologies, um, in particular, kind of speak to the democratization of being able to create games. And um, I, I think that's great for players in that content's going to come definitely from China, but really from all over the world. Um, but I, you look at film, um, ultimately the films that resonate in any given region have to do more with cultural sensibilities and just resonance um, than they do about differences in labor costs or uh, you know any of these other factors. And I think uh, you know sometimes you get these crazy surprise sparks like Starcraft in Korea, for example, like that wasn't planned. Blizzard wasn't you know doing market research to figure out how to make the intellectual property that resonated the best in Korea. It just it happened. And um, sometimes you get lucky like that. And, and so I think some content from China really, um, you know, is starting to resonate here, which is awesome. And as a player, I'm excited to see these things happen. Um, but it, it's never going to be a consistent, you know, one country dominating another country's market from a cultural sensibility perspective. It's, uh, there's, there's a little bit of uh, magic there. So I, I think we know our players the best. And so we have an inherent advantage. Um, China absolutely has that advantage for their massive player base as well. Um, but I, you know, I think the democratization creates the potential for crossover and, and that's really exciting, both as a player and, and from a business perspective. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Do you have any final words or if someone wanted to reach out to you, any way that people can get in touch with, with you guys? Well, sure. uh, oh, sorry, David. Go, go ahead. ahead, Sean, you're first. Oh, okay, excellent. I win. Um, Gearbox is our hiring. Check out our website. We're, we're you know, super ambitious. We you know, want to entertain the world, and we're looking for folks who want to take that journey with us, both on the software side and on the publishing side. Um, you got to always find me on LinkedIn, Sean Aaron, and or just look on our websites. But, you know, great to have this opportunity to, to David, to see you again. Tim, awesome meeting you. And Joe, thanks for inviting me. David? Yeah, I, uh, you can reach me through a variety of ways, but probably the easiest way is on Twitter, uh, David Brevik. And, uh, and uh, you know, I have websites and all sorts of stuff for both my Greybeard Games uh, company as well as Skystone. And uh, so, you know, you can get a hold of me there uh, and we can talk about anything. Thank you again. It's good to see you again, Sean. And nice to meet you, Tim. And thank you so much, Joseph, for, for this. No problem. And Tim, and by the way, can you mention when your game's coming out? Is it going to be a while or when can we, we are, We're literally just at the beginning. So we're, we're years out still from, uh, from launching. Uh, but yeah, anybody who's interested in um, our game or Frost Giant as a company, um, we have a newsletter that you can sign up for at frostgiant.com. Uh, we've also got a pretty active community on the Frost Giant subreddit. 
Uh, but for any business stuff or to reach out to me directly, LinkedIn is the best way to do that. But yes, yeah, sincere thanks to you for hosting all this and getting it organized and really great to meet you guys. Look forward to keeping in touch in the years to come. Awesome. Totally. All right. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.